Listen, I understand that a lot of people coming into your area will absolutely cause a strain on the local economy and a lot of other things. Uh, you know, people coming from different regions, different temperatures, right? You know, coming into Chicago and instantly basically freezing, right? I get all of these things, but I'm not sure that I fully believe that the mayor is actually ready to, uh, like, remove sanctuary status from Illinois, right? Specifically Chicago, right? Um, I'm not sure that he's ready to do that because he's still basically arguing with all of the people who are saying that this is the most ridiculous thing that they could have ever even called themselves a sanctuary city. But either way, um, the minute video is a breaking point. Uh, Chicago struggles to serve a flood of migrants. Um, this is a suggestion via Discord, guys. Go ahead and check this out. Let's see where this takes us. The mayor of Chicago says a migrant surge has his city at the breaking point, and he's pleading to Congress for help. Another one. Mayor Brandon Johnson is feeling the overwhelming weight of being a sanctuary city. CBN contributing correspondent Paul Petit shows us how area churches and ministries are helping pick up the slack. Okay. More than 300,000 migrants crossed the U.S.-Mexico border in December, according to data from U.S. Customs and Border Protection. That's the highest monthly total since 2000. And now its effects are being felt here in Chicago, setting this sanctuary city in a scramble to keep up with the influx. Migrants at asylum seekers sit waiting for a hot breakfast and donated clothing at this church on Chicago's west side. It is not unusual for them to get up at 3.30 in the morning to get on the L at 4 because it might be two hours for them to get here. And at those hours in January, it's usually below freezing. They'll arrive here wearing t-shirts and sandals, and we're in Chicago. In the morning. Catholic churches, many of them partnering with the city of Chicago, are working to keep up with the recent influx of migrants. Yeah, guys, they definitely were not ready for that temperature shift at all. We've had upwards toward 300 people come on a given day. The vast majority do come from Venezuela. But we also get people coming from Ecuador and from Colombia. They are also fleeing oppression. They're, a lot of them are fleeing the drug cartels. Saul is a lot of them are, are fleeing uh, the fact that they can't find work in their country. Uh, that's the actual reasoning. Um, not all of them are actually, uh, you know, going to pass the asylum tests. Because uh, the majority of them are going to fail and be sent back to their country. They're also fleeing oppression. They're, a lot of them are fleeing the drug cartels. Saul is an attorney from Venezuela. He says his family left the country out of fear of the authoritarian government. In Venezuela, eh, soy abogado. I am an attorney and things were very difficult in Venezuela. I felt that me and my family were at risk of persecution. In the last year and a half, over 26,000 migrants have arrived here. Saul says Chicago's sanctuary city status is the reason he came. Oh. Sometimes they don't have a choice. They are just sent on a bus and the bus is headed to a sanctuary city like Chicago. Last month, Texas sent unannounced busloads of migrants, some even on a charter jet to Illinois. The city then bused them to its migrant landing zone. These unexpected newcomers have Chicago Mayor Brandon Johnson fuming at Texas Governor Greg Newcomers. Gabbett. The reckless and, quite frankly, the unsafe behavior of the governor of Texas has caused a great deal of trepidation. But organizers... Yeah, but you guys, you, you're calling yourself a sanctuary city. Right? I mean, I get it, right? But if you're a sanctuary city and these people are, are, are basically flooding in through the southern borders, where else are they supposed to go? Because uh, Texas doesn't have any sanctuary cities, so if you guys are saying that, you might as well have them all then, right? Until you change your tune and, and kind of get with the program and fully understand that this is no longer um, an acceptable path for your city, right? These individuals will come to your city and bankrupt your city. That's just a fact, guys. Texas has caused a great deal of trepidation. But organizers and volunteers here say they have to set politics aside at a time like this. I've been saying to people, this is not a political issue for us. These are people who are in need and in care, and we're answering the gospel message. Say yeah, I don't blame them. I don't, like them, these, the churches, this is just what they do, right? So this is not anything to even, you know, to, to even show, because we know that out of, if anyone is going to help, it's going to be them, right? These are people who are in need and in care. And we're answering the gospel message. St. Edmunds began its ministry to help the nearby YMCA and Oak Park Police, which operates shelters for the migrants. Now it's an interdenominational effort. 
It is the most beautiful interfaith effort. We have the Presbyterians, the, uh, the Congregationalists, the Methodists. And here on the northwest side of Chicago, City Line Bible Church is partnering with World Relief Chicagoland. Church leaders say many of their first arrivals have found jobs and moved into apartments. Some are now serving at the church. Okay. But a breaking point. Of yeah, I definitely do hope that um, uh, the locals that are also suffering from something, right, uh, specifically anything similar to this, let's say they're homeless. I definitely hope the locals are still allowed in these places. Moved into apartments. Some are now serving at the church. But a breaking point is on the horizon as more buses arrive from Texas. Mayor Johnson says his city and 27 shelters are near capacity. In November, Johnson opposed a 60-day limit for migrants to stay at those shelters. Today, many are near that limit. Without significant intervention from the federal government, this mission will not be sustained. In Chicago, Paul Petit, CBN News. Yeah, like, here's the thing. Um, so obviously for the constituents that voted uh, Mayor Johnson in, specifically that are, um, you know, let's say they politically align with his uh, uh, message, let's say. What he's basically saying, in somewhat of a veiled method here, he's saying, hey, Biden, if you still want this, uh, this city to kind of vote for you, you need to make it so you give us money to basically mitigate the 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 harm on the actual city because we've made all these these excuses and, and never actually gave concessions let's say to the people uh of the city itself all the excuses that mayor johnson and the other mayors have given for why the south side of chicago looks the way it looks we're broke you can't you know <laughs> so all of a sudden these constituents that voted biden in are now also looking at Mayor Johnson like, bro, what's what's actually happening here? You're not helping out our city, but you said you had no money, but you pulled billions of dollars out of nowhere. Where'd that money come from, Mayor Johnson? Huh? Let me know, Mayor Johnson. That's what this conversation's about, bro. And and that's what he's trying to say, but not say out loud, bro. Will not be sustained. You're about to lose us. Stained. In Chicago, Paul Petit, CBN News. All right, let's go. Thanks, Paul. Breaking point aside, Gordon, it is encourages, encouraging to see ministries put aside politics to respond to the humanitarian need. Well, Christians always respond. Christians always respond in love. They always respond with help. They always want to help the stranger. Uh, and and these, we take these biblical commandments uh, very seriously. But let's take a much bigger picture that when, when you give food to the poor, uh, everybody congratulates you. Everybody says you're doing a great job. When you start asking the question, why do the poor not have any food? Well, then you get all kinds of political accusations at you. So let's start asking the fundamental problem. Why is there such a rush of migration to the United States? What is going on? And are we doing anything to solve that? We can't. The only way to do that is to basically burn money. Um, so the only way for these other nations to kind of come back to the point where they no longer are, are looking for any type of remittance or economic migrancy, let's say, right? The only way for that to work is if we got rid of a gigantic portion of the money that was actually printed. Uh, the fact that all of these currencies are basically backed off of the U.S. dollar when we started printing money uh, and inflation hit us the way it hit us, guys, it hit all of these other countries worse, Okay, um, so if it's expensive here to get an apartment, people a lot of people are complaining about cost of living. Think about it being probably 10 times that wherever they're coming from, right? So they're trying to escape that, make money here so they can send money back to their, their country. Uh, that's, that's the thing. So the only way to actually fix this uh, is to basically burn a good amount of the money and that would then make people think that they still are, they still have the ability to afford the American dream, for example, right? If we get rid of about 10 trillion of the money of the dollars that we printed, that in itself will make things much cheaper because your money will be worth more. That's the reality, right? But all right, let's get What is going on and are we doing anything to solve that? The federal government, it's absolutely amazing to me, they're taking the state of Texas to court to stop them from enforcing the law that they themselves refuse to enforce. It's, it's, it's beyond insane. 
They've thrown a big, you know, welcome home sign up on our southern border yes. and have encouraged refugees from all over the world, the world to yep. take an incredible journey, a life-threatening journey, in order to get here. I don't understand doing that. That shouldn't be. Now, as a country, what should we be doing to make the living conditions in their own country better? how they can find opportunity, employment, how can they do these things there. I understand in Venezuela with that government, it's not gonna happen, right, but that's what not about gonna in work. Mexico? What can we do there to help them and, and grow their economy? How can we be a force of good, a light to the nations to let them know there's a much better way and you can have a hope mm. and you can have a future right where you are. If we start doing these things as a matter of public policy for the United States of America, we can solve this problem. But if we don't even attempt it, well, we're going to continue to see this. And on the political front, the immigration crisis is going to be a major political influence on our upcoming Absolutely. election. Absolutely. The mayor of this last part, this last part right here was somewhat valid. Like, how do you make it so people want to stay in their country, right? Um, and not specifically come directly to the United States of America? Um, that would basically mean enriching other nations, right? That's basically how that would uh, kind of work there, giving people the overall pathway to what made us successful. That makes any sense here uh, now uh, in terms of pointing out mexico specifically being a place that um, could most likely need to be the one that needs to change because a lot of people are going through mexico if, if they felt mexico itself uh, had opportunities similar to the United States of America, would they even come to the United States of America? No, they wouldn't. Right? They recognize that Mexico does not. Um, the reason why we're attracting so many people from all around the world, literally, okay, um, like specifically China, um, uh, a good bit of West Africa, East Africa, also the southern tip of it. Um, and uh, we're pulling a lot of people from, from other countries that are not even connected to us or even touching us. Guys. Absolutely. Um, these people could equally go to Europe, but they're not doing that. They're choosing to come here, right? We still have the strongest economy. We still do, right? And this is why they're coming. Purely economic migrancy, guys, remittance to their nations, right? And there are some countries in West Africa specifically that actually um, have super terrible GDPs, right? And because their GDP is generally so terrible, they need other things that can also bring money to their nation. And they do, in fact, um, you know, work with sending people to the, to the border uh, to basically infiltrate the nation and send money back to their country, which adds, in a sense, to their local economy. That's, what that's, what's, that's what's happening here. Right? How do we make it so people want to stay and, and build in their nations? With us existing, I'm not even sure it's possible. Um, other than basically, well, it is. I guess it is possible, um, but it would seriously involve burning a gigantic amount of debt or capital that we we printed uh, during the the nineteen. Okay, when we printed that money, we made all of the U.S. dollars around the world weaker. That's what we did. Right. But um, that wasn't the smartest thing in the world, but it saved us, you know, so we can send money to uh, the Ukraine and Israel. I guess they, that was, that's the main reason, I think, right? Um, <laughs> but it's not really beneficial to us as a nation, guys. It isn't. Uh, but all right, listen, you guys all have an absolutely amazing day. Enjoy your day. Thoroughly. Guys, before we go, are you guys subscribed to the other channels? Logical Movie Reviews with Mr. L. Boyd along with Mr. L. Boyd Music. Both are found in the description. Check it out.